Well, good morning, Christ Church. Let's rise to our feet today. Let's begin this day by singing praise to our God, by giving him the glory that only he and he alone deserves. Let's sing out together. Our right, hands together, come on. Here we go. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, no, I won't drown. When I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. And when I'm broken, come on, down to nothing, well, I know that you are always up to something good. Christ Church, we doing good? Oh, it is so good to see everybody today. I hope you're doing well. My name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so glad you chose to be with us today. Whether you've been with us every single Sunday for the last couple years, or whether you've been with us for 20, 30, 40 years, or if it's your first time, we're so glad you chose to be with us. Hey, real quick, if you are new and uh, you're watching online, maybe you could text the, uh, the word welcome to this number. It's simply 260 260- 
260-202-1121. Just text the word welcome, and we'll get you connected to what God is doing. It'll take you to a connection card where you can fill that out. Uh, If you're in the room, we'd love you to go out these doors to the left. There's a place we call the next steps. You'll hear me talk a lot about what next steps we have to take. And uh, what you can do is you can fill the card out there. They'll give you a nice little travel mug and so some candy in it. Um, if your breath's smelling bad, you can grab that, you know, and then you feel free to talk to people, right? Um, we're glad you're with us, but there's a couple quick uh, announcements that we want to make. Tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. is our CC Teens Ministry. It's every Sunday night from 6 to 8. You come in the north door. So if you've got a student who's in 7th through 12th grade, we'd love them to join us. Um, bring them here. Uh, drop them off. We're going to have food, some uh, snacks, some drinks, and just kind of hang out, and uh, then we have some uh, kind of a lesson time and some games, and so it's just a great time, but we'd love to have them uh, join us. Uh, The next announcement that we have for you today, and I forget the order of them, so shame on me. There we go. Pickleball, that's it. Um, Pickleball is every second and fourth Thursday of the month. Anybody ever play pickleball? Yeah, raise your hand. So I finally did. Oh my goodness, man. That is a, that's a workout, all right? Um, this body is not created for that, but it's fun, all right? I hit the ball over the net, so all right? So just deal with it. By the way, I won at Cornhole, and my partner and I won the championship, so deal with that, all right? Um, so I'm not a loser to everything, all right? You're gonna, you know you're going to deal with that for the next year, right, until we lose next year? I'm just throwing it out there. No, hey, <laughs> so we got pickleball. It's a great time, and the last announcement that I have is this one here. It is uh, one more announcement. There it is. Better small groups, okay? Um, I don't know about you, but I'm loving this better series about how do we get better at home, how do we make our relationships better, and we have better small groups every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And if you haven't jumped into one, you can still jump in, all right? They're open to anybody. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, they're here in classroom C2, just over this hallway, and they are from 6.30 to 7.30. On Thursday night, it's from 7 to 8, okay? So Tuesday and Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30, Thursday night, 7 to 8. And then we have one Sundays, right after church. It'll be from 11.45 to about 12.45, 1 o'clock. Um, but we just want people to get involved. It's a great way to get to know more people and just kind of follow up from the, today's message and, and just kind of connect a little bit more deeply. Hey, we're glad you're here today. I'm excited for what God is, has in store because we have Truck or Treat coming up. Yes? Come on, Truck or Treat. Oh, come on. That's sad. We have 1,500, 1,500, 1,600 kids who walk through this building on Truck or Treat Night. So we need y'all's help, all right? We need tons of candy, and I mean tons, all right? Um, I think we need something like 50,000 pieces or something like that. I don't know. It's crazy, but if you go right now to like Myers, go like buy one, get one half off, um, the more you bring in, uh, the more like sugared up you can get kids and you can get revenge on maybe people that drive you nuts, all right? Um, it's a great way to love on the, the community, okay? Uh, but, but we want to make it an incredible night. Also, we need people to man tables. We need you to volunteer to host your own table. You get to decorate your table, and then we provide the candy for those tables. We help out with that. But you get to decorate it however you want. You get to interact with these kids and their parents. Um, We would love for for table hosts. I think we need around 30 tables. uh, So we would love for you to get connected. You can sign up on our website, or you can go to Next Steps. Anything you want to know, go to Next Steps. We're going to our website, all right? Hey, greet those around you this morning. Tell them that God loves them, and we're going to continue to worship. All right, here we go. Let's continue to worship this morning at Christ Church. Hands together. Do you see what I see? Do you see? What I say, come on. I see lightning, I hear thunder. Something stirring six feet under. Dead things coming back to life again. 
again I believe there's about to be another resurrection I see signs and I see wonder I see birds of living color Dead things coming back to life again Resurrection. Oh. So come alive, wake up, sleeper. He is risen. We are risen with Him. Come on.
Cause the spirit was moving over the water Spirit come move over us Come and rest on us Come and rest on us As the spirit was moving over the water Spirit come move over us Come and rest on us Come and rest on us So calm down Spirit when you move you make my heart pound When you feel the room You're here and I know you Feel the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you are feeling. Hey. And as the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come move over us. Come rest on. Oh, no.
You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me Yes, you did You have been so, so kind to me
may be seated. Man, check out this video as we, as we continue together today. Check out this video this morning. Well, good morning, Christ Church. How we doing? We doing good? Man, you can just sense the energy in the room. It is awesome, isn't it? Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord today? I mean, are you guys excited about what God is doing in your life? Are you excited about what God is doing in this church? Are you excited about what God is doing in this community through this group of people? Because, man, he is on the move. And uh, I want to let you know now, we got four baptisms at the end of service today, all right? So we're going to celebrate like nothing else. Um, hey, by the way, if you're new here and you're going, man, they are crazy. Yes, we are. Um, uh, we're a wild bunch of people, uh, probably none like any church you've seen or been a part of. Um, we are weird. We know that. Uh, we're different, and it's okay because we love God, and we love what he is doing. I'm, I'm Jason. I'm the lead pastor, if you don't know. Um, and whether you've been here for forever and you're here each week or if you're brand new, we just want to say we're glad you chose to join us today, and we're excited about what God has in store. Uh, we're in this series that we're simply calling Better. And the whole idea is that how do we win at home? How do we get better in our relationships? How do we get better in our lives? And, and now a lot of what we've been discussing, a lot of what we're discussing in this series, I, I know it's about marriage, it's about parenting, it, it's about family stuff, it, it's all these things. But, but if, if you are here, if you are here and you're single, if you're here and you're single and you're not sure if you want to get married or you're single and you want to get married, if you're here and you're divorced, if you're here and, and, and a loved one has passed away and, and you're a widow, no matter what your, your background is, no matter where you are at in life, God wants you here. God desires you to be here because he has something to say. And, and I know that, that, that sometimes we can go, well, man, this whole family thing, it's, it's not my stage of life. It's not where I'm at. I'm just going to check out. And can I, just, can I just talk to you real quick? Don't check out. Don't, don't stop coming. Don't, don't allow Satan to get a foothold in your life because that's what he's wanting to do. He's wanting to get a foothold in your life. He's wanting you to think that you don't need to be here, that you don't need to be a part of the family, and then you miss two, three, four Sundays because it's a series that maybe you're not sure if it connects to you, and then you get kind of pulled apart from the church. It's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants you to, to not be in God's word, to not be a part of the fellowship. And I'm telling you, everything that we talk about in the series, there's a piece every single week that God has just for you that you can gain wisdom. Now, as we continue this morning, I've got a question for everyone, all right, as we start. The question is a small, short question, simply this. What do lovebirds, puffins, mice, albatrosses or albatrice, whatever, it's plural, um, coyotes, bald eagles, vultures, beavers, lizards, doves, seahorses, gibbons, cranes, owls, geese, swans, monkeys, pigeons, parakeets, macaws, wolves, angelfish, foxes, penguins, sea turtles, flatworms, and condors, all have in common. Anybody know what they all have in common? Okay. What, what, they have mates. What, anybody else? Way in the back. They mate for life. That's the answer. Anybody, anybody else get that right? They mate for life. Don't don't lie in church. All right. God knows. No no. So but they mate for life. That's the answer. All these creatures mate for life. And no matter how small percentages that is of like all the animals of the animal kingdom. It still, I think, is pretty fascinating that God pre-wired these creatures, these animals, these specific species, to literally mate for life. Now, here's the thing. Did you know that you and I, we were designed, we were pre-wired to mate for life as well? That we were designed by God to mate for life. Do you realize that, that everything an animal does, they do because it's part of their nature. That they're acting out the perfect harmony that they were created with by God the Father. That he created these animals to be a certain way. And so when your dog is potty training and they pee on the floor and you get frustrated, it's just part of their nature because they're used to being able to pee wherever they want to pee, all right? They can go to the bathroom any place they want to. As humans, as adults, if we did that, that's probably a bad idea, right? You're probably going to get in trouble. Now, kids, uh, I love my little, my little grandson's side because he doesn't care. He just goes, stands on the, on the side of the porch and just pees. He's like, 
What, Paul Paul? You, okay, whatever, buddy. You know, so, um, but as adults, we, we can't do that. You see, we were designed by God a little bit different, actually not a little bit different, but a lot different than animals. We, we were designed and created by God because in this unique way because we are made in the image of God. We are God's image bearers. And God gave us something that is a reflection of him. Because God is a sovereign God, he gave us this this ability to make choices. He gave us the ability to to have free will. So we can choose whether or not we want to follow God, we want to follow God's plans, we want to follow God's design for our lives, or we can choose to be like the animals and not. Now, Scripture is clear that we are called and designed to mate for life. Now, now I know as I'm speaking right now, some of you are going, all right, great, this isn't me, this is something about marriage, this is something about, and some of you are probably checking out, and some of you are going, it doesn't apply to my life. Listen to me, because you, you may think it doesn't apply to your life, but I'm telling you, this thought of marriage, this thought of, of being together, it's something that God talks about throughout Scripture. It is God telling us about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back again. And I know that some of you are in different life stages, whether you're widowed or, or you're divorced or, or you're single or whatever, but, but this, this, this situation that you're in, this current situation, whatever you're going through in life, we have to understand that every single one of us in this room, everyone watching online, we are all connected by this idea of marriage. That we are all connected to this idea of marriage, and it's critical to each and every one of us. And since that's true, since we are hardwired by God for this relationship, then I have to ask this simple question. Why in the world is it so hard? I mean, if God created us for this, and he tells us this in his word, why is this so hard? Because if you look at Hollywood and Disney and all these things, it always says, And they lived what? And they lived happily ever after. (laughs) Whatever, right? (laughs) That's just a fairy tale. It's not real. It's not truth. And if we're hardwired for marriage, then then why are we surrounded by so many bitter and tragic stories of of bitter divorce, of of stories of infidelity, of, of broken homes, stories of scarred and cynical children, Blended families that struggle with step-parents and step-kids. One night stands, sexual regret, a pandemic of pornography that is happening, deviant sexual behavior, the victimization of, of sex trafficking, and child sex abuse. If this is how we're pre-wired by God, then, then why is it so hard? And I believe it's because of the expectations that we've created on our own. Expectations that we've, we've created for marriages. Expectations that we've created for relationships. I mean, have you ever heard somebody go, oh, they just complete me. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, come on, really? But, but, but we're just like this. No, you're not. You know, oh, we started this relationship, it's so good. Give it a week, give it two weeks. All right? It's not that easy. And I'm not trying to, like, you know, say you up for this, like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be awful, it's going to be terrible. I'm not, I'm not telling you that. I'm not like, oh, man, I came to church and the pastors tell me how bad relationships are. No, but the truth is it's hard, isn't it? I mean, marriage and, and relationships and just relationships with family and with, with friends and coworkers, it is so difficult. It's It's tough. But this idea that that, that that person completes me, the only person that can complete you is Jesus Christ himself. The only person that can complete your life, that can make you whole, is the one who died on the cross for you and rose again. That that person who you think you're in love with and, and you may choose to love them, but, but they're going to let you down. They're going to disappoint you. They're, it's going to fall. They're going to stumble. Everything's going to be, it's going to be a struggle. See, everyone hopes for that happily ever after, but the truth is, it's just a fairy tale. But, but it's kind of this unwritten expectation that we have in our lives and in our relationships, and I believe it's because of this. Because marriage is the most basic construct of the human condition and the human community. It is the most basic construct of the human condition and human community. And, and what we have to understand is that Satan that if Satan can confuse marriage, 
that if Satan can confuse the most basic construct, that if he can confuse it, if he can break it, if he can twist it, if he can attack it, if he can distort it, then Satan wins and he destroys what God has created. See, marriage is at the root of who we all are. I mean, marriage is at the root of who we all are, at least from the perspective of God himself. And I want to prove this to you today. I want to talk you through this. See, when we look at the beginning of the Bible, when we look at how the Bible begins, when we open up our Bible and we open that leather you know, binder up and we get through the, the beginning pages and all the, 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 you know, the glossary and all this other stuff, when we get to the, the beginning, we look and, and, and we see that God created the world. He created the heavens and the earth. That God created light and darkness and he created the moon and the stars and he created water and animals and God created Adam. And then what's the very next thing that we have after Adam? We have a wedding. We have a wedding ceremony. See, Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 says, the Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. And then he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, oh my, wow, thank you God, you have done well, amen. (laughs) That is not what he said, but I told you sometimes I want you to know what I would think, all right? That would have been me. But he said, and the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And the two become, say it with me, one flesh. Say that again. Adam and Eve, his wife, were both naked. Again, thank you, God. And they felt no shame. So the Bible begins with this wedding. God gave the first bride away to Adam. You know how scripture ends? You know how the Bible ends? With a wedding. Revelations chapter 21, verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Understand this, church. You and I, we are the new Jerusalem. We are his temple. It says, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. Jesus told his disciples, and he was telling us, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am going, you may also go. And he goes on and says, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4 says, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. One of my favorite lines, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has now passed away. And just before this in Revelation, just before that passage, it actually talks about a feast. It actually talks about the wedding feast. But that's not all the wedding talk that we find in Scripture. If we go a little bit further, we we see that it was the backdrop for Jesus' entire ministry. I mean, you know how Jesus began his ministry? He began it with a wedding. Jesus was was at this wedding, and and they'd run out of wine. And I I think Jesus is a little bit, probably a little bit frustrated with his mom, a little bit perturbed, because I don't think he was ready to step onto the scene yet. But he steps onto the scene, he performs this miracle, and they, 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 they run out of wine, And I love Mary. Mary's like, you know what, just go get Jesus. He'll take care of it. I mean, she knew already, you know. Moms know their kids, don't they? She knew what what, what Jesus could do. And she's like, you know, Jesus, just just go talk to him and he'll take care of that. And so Jesus turns the water into wine. And his ministry begins. It was the very first miracle, the very first sign. It was at a wedding. Do you know how Jesus ended his ministry on earth? He met with these gentlemen and and his disciples in this upper room. And in that upper room, he he started talking to them. And he was trying to get them prepared for what was about to come next. And some of the most profound words that Jesus would ever speak, would ever say, came in that room. 
In John 14, verse 1, Jesus says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many, many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Church, what we have to understand when we look at this context is this is wedding language in that, that time. That back in, in the time where Jesus is talking, th- this is wedding language. It is what every prospective groom said to a prospective bride in those times, in those moments. It was the proposal of the Jewish culture. And Jesus, it's, it, it bookends Jesus' ministry. See, it's the earthly relationship that the Apostle Paul talks about, that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the power of God, that he helps us to understand the eternal relationship, the union between Jesus Christ and his bride, you and I, the church. And so when you look at God's word in totality, you can see that this this marriage, this wedding thing, it's a huge deal to him. And it's no wonder that it has been under attack from day one from Satan. Now, now today I want to spend just some time diving into to how we connect in relationships, how we connect emotionally, and how we connect in, in kind of together and in, in how God has wired you and I to be in a relationship. And what I want you to see is I want you to see is, like, you know, before we go further, I want to see how many people I connect with in this moment, okay? After church today, some of you will go home, you get in your cars, you go home and eat. But some of you, many of you, I, I assume, are going to go out for lunch, right? You're going to go out to lunch, and, and after church, it's going to be a great time. But here's the thing. <clears throat> the husband, the man, will say, what do you want to eat for lunch, dear? <laughs> Men, this is your chance. I want you loud, proud, one voice together with me. The answer will be on the screen, but let's say this together. Your wife will say... I don't care, whatever you'd like to eat, dear. <clears throat> Men, it's a trap. Abort mission, all right? Do, do not pass go, do not trust what she just said because you know that that's not true, right? You see, here's what I know about men. Men, when it gets to be close to noon after, after church is over, all we have in our mind is one four letter F word, all right? If your mind's going there bad on you, the word is food, right? That's all we care about, food. Taco, pizza, hamburger, steak, pasta. I don't care, food. You know, we'll make the decision. So we choose to go someplace. We're like, all right, we're going to drive. We got to pull into place, and the wife's like, you know, I ate here a couple weeks ago. I'm not really, it's been a couple weeks. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not really into this. Okay, then, where would you like to eat, dear? I don't care, wherever you want to eat. You know, (laughs) And so you go to the next place. For guys, it's, here, here's the thing. For guys, we don't have like an emotional investment in the decision we make for lunch. We just want food. All right? I got no problem with it. I mean, preferably, shigs, I'm good. Buffalo Wild Wings, either one of those, I'm good. But if you just say Taco Bell, all right, I can get tacos. I'm good. You know, if you say McDonald's, all right, whatever. And there's some places like sushi, I don't know why. Why would you eat raw fish? That's stupid. We're not seals and penguins, all right? We're humans, right? So, but, but the thing is, is like, wives, you get, like, women, you, you're emotionally invested in things. Like, you are emotion, and I'll get to this, but here's the thing. My wife and I, Jessica, we just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary this past Tuesday, and it was all, thank you. <coughs> and uh, I, in all honesty, man, uh, um, This is where I get a little choked up, so I apologize, but um, 25 years has been amazing. And uh, my wife, Jessica, um, (laughs) she is the luckiest woman alive (laughs) and uh, very blessed. Um, It's it's, it's hard for me to say those words, but I won't know. Um, It's been an incredible journey. But but here's the thing, When, when we talk about lunch, she now, knowing that we've been married and that we kind of have this discussion, um, she'll give me like three or four places we can't go. She's like, here's three or four places I don't want to go. Then you can pick. Sweet. So we've kind of gotten through that a little bit. We kind of figured that out. But l- like I said, 
Men aren't really emotionally invested in that decision. We just make it. But, but here's the thing that I've learned about women and about wives is like, women, you're like thinking about 40 different things at one time. You're really emotionally invested in what's happening. It's like you, you've got kind of these things going through your head. Like women are thinking three-dimensional, and men, we're lucky if we're thinking one-dimensional, right? You know, and, and women, you're, you're thinking, what do I have to do today? Um, do I have to get the laundry done for the kids because they got marching band or they got volleyball, they got football tomorrow, so I'm going to get that done? Is the house clean? I'm not sure. If we go to this place, who am I going to see? Who do I not want to see? And so, like, all these things, and, and that's not saying that you're indecisive. It's just that's how you're wired. That's how you operate. And men were just like, food. You know, <laughs> and that's just honest, and that's why it, it's so, but here's the thing. Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. We should get back to the Word of God, okay? Let's get back to this. But, but Paul says this, and, and don't forget this. We're going to come back to this one. Paul says, 21, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the whole thing. This is the whole enchilada, speaking of lunch. This is the context. This is all about relationships here. I know we're talking about marriage. I know we're talking about family stuff. But, but Paul is talking about all relationships in this moment. He's talking about mothers and daughters and, and, and dads and, and sons, and he's talking about grandparents, and he's talking about, about friends, and he's talking about kids, and he's talking about coworkers and neighbors, and, and on and on and on. He's saying, submit to one another. You don't always get to call the shots. You don't always make all the decisions. But, but how do we do that? Paul goes on, he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Here's the thing. At that moment, men are like, good, great word from God. Let's just stop right there. You know? And, and this word submit has become like a dirty word in our language because culture has destroyed this word like it does every good gift from God. But that's just her submission. That's not his submission. Remember that first verse when it said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's these two components. There's submit, and, and as we're about to read about, there's love. There's submit and love, and these two components actually go hand in hand. These two components go together because it's much easier to submit to someone who you know truly loves you and has your best interest at heart. It's easy to submit to someone who is looking out for you and looking out for the best for you. And it's a lot easier to love someone who respects you and is a cheerleader for you and is there to encourage you. Paul goes on, verse 25, he says, husbands, love your wives. So he's shifting from submit to love. And he says, just as Christ loved the church, can we stop right there? How much did Christ love the church? He, he was willing to be scourged. He was willing to be beaten. He was willing to be mocked. He was willing to be, to be shouted at and spit upon. He was willing to go to a cross and take nails in his hands and his feet. I, I, I've talked to a lot of guys who are frustrated or struggle with their marriage, and yet when I, I sit down and I look at them, I have yet to see any nail prints in their hands. as Christ loved the church, that he gave himself up for her. Love your wife as Christ loved the church, that he gave himself up for her. Now here's the thing, guys, listen to me. Guys, that means that you can make any decision that you want because the husband is the head of the wife. So guys, you can make any decision you want because the husband is the head of the wife, just as scripture says. But, it's a big but up there, okay? But here's the thing. She has total veto power. <laughs> she has total veto power because here's the thing. Loving your wife is more important than your decision. Loving your wife is way more important than any decision you could ever make. When you, when you submit to someone, it's because you trust them and you love them and you know they have the best. When you love someone, they will do anything for you. 
Christ loved the church so much he gave himself up. It goes on in verse 26. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. This is about spiritual leadership it's talking about. Verse 27. To present her to himself, to Jesus, as a radiant church without stain, without wrinkle, without any blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29. After all, no one, no one ever hated their own body. But they feed, I feed mine a little bit too much, and they care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become, say with me again, one flesh. Verse 32, this is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought he was talking about marriage. Uh, this whole time, I, I thought, thought he was talking about marriage, but he says, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. Well, he is talking about marriage. Because our earthly marriage, our earthly marriages are all designed to help us understand the heavenly marriage that we will have to our Savior. He says in verse 33, however, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. We just stop right there. This idea of love and respect. This idea of love and respect. Go back to, to Ephesians 5, verse 21. It says, the heart and mindset. The heart and mindset is mutual submission. It's mutual submission to one another. It's not one who dictates or, or has authoritarian power over someone. It's not one who browbeats someone, but you have this mutual submission to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ himself because of what he did. I want you to picture this. Just kind of like this, this music stand right here, okay? Just pretend that this is like an altar, all right? Back in the Old Testament, back in the New Testament, an altar, it was made of stone. And they would, they would set things on fire. They would burn their, their offerings to God on this altar, and what happened at the altar was you would bring this animal as a sacrifice, you'd bring this animal as an offering, and it would be put here, sacrificed on the altar, and given to God. Now, when I was younger, I'd hear people say, we're going to the church, to the altar, to get married. We're going to go to the altar to be married. We got married at the altar in the front of the church. We, we got married at the altar, and, and, and so I get, what, what does that actually mean? Well, what does it actually mean? Well, let me show you, okay? Imagine I'm the groom, okay? And I'm on this side, all right? I'm bringing my everything to the altar. I am, I'm bringing my, my, my wants. I'm bringing my dreams. I'm bringing my hopes. Everything that I want, everything that I desire, I'm bringing that, and I'm laying that down on this altar. Now, now imagine over here, if I'm the bride. Don't imagine that. I'm a picture. Anyway, the bride brings their offering too. They bring their hopes, their dreams, they bring their desires, they bring everything, and they lay it at the altar. They lay it on top of the altar as their offering. They lay everything that they have, all that is theirs, on this offer or this altar as a burnt offering. You see, because here's the thing. Marital love is supposed to be selfless love. Marital love is supposed to be an altar of burnt offering offering love. Marital love is supposed to be one flesh love. But we can say that also in our relationships with our children, with our parents, with our grandparents. That, that it should be something where it's selfless. That it is love that we give, that we don't expect to receive, but we give everything that we can. But in marriage, God takes two lives. He takes two hopes. He takes two dreams. He takes two realities, and he forges them into one, into one single flesh relationship. And only, and only God can do that. Matthew, Jesus teaches us in verse, chapter 19, verse 4, he says, Haven't you read, he replied, that in the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become, what is it? One flesh. So they are no longer two, but they are what? One flesh. Man, Jason, I thought you just made that up. No, no, this is a Jesus thing, all right? Therefore, what God has joined together, let no... One, separate. Wait, didn't we just read that in Ephesians 5, 31 also? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become what? One flesh. 
You see, we surrender ourselves to each other. We, we surrender ourselves to one another and we form a new identity. And it happens only under the lordship of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit by the power of God Almighty himself. Husbands, we are called to love our wives. And God's word gives the specifics of how we are to love our wives. And wives are called to respect their husbands. It's love and respect. Love and respect. And these two things are mutually edifying when they go together. In other words, if a husband is properly loving his wife, if he's loving her, not loving her to get things in return, not hoping that he has a nice night, but loving her like Christ loves the church, then this empowers the wife to respect her husband. And then which empowers him to love her even more. When we look at these two words, when you look at these words submit and respect, they actually mean the same thing in this passage. When we look at submit, it's actually this, it's voluntarily accepting leadership of another through encouraging and cheerleading and affirming that role. The problem is that's not usually how it goes, is it? That, that, that's usually not how that happens in our marriages or in our, our relationships. Yet too often things go out of control and they begin to spiral out of control and we call that thing the crazy cycle, okay? And, and it's literally... Uh, it's, it's been researched. Without love, she reacts. Without respect, he reacts. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's like the man decides, you know what? I've got a lot of hobbies, and I'm going to continue to do those hobbies, and I just don't want to go home, which then the wife in turn reacts and goes, it'd be nice if you were home once in a while. It'd be nice if the kids understood that they actually had a dad, which then makes you mad. Then you don't want to be home anymore. And so this cycle continues. But here is the good news. It can change. It can reverse. Remember what we said in week one? God can redeem anything. God can redeem anything. Only God can do it. God can redeem anything. God can redeem your broken marriage. God can redeem your broken relationship with your kids. God can redeem that drug addiction, that porn addiction, that alcohol addiction. God can redeem anything that is happening in your life, anything that is broken, anything that is holding you back, anything that is taking you down that spiral. God can redeem it and he can reverse the direction of that. Amen? Amen. And only God can do that. You see, all it takes is one person being selfless. All it takes is one person saying, I'm not going to act this way in my marriage, in my relationship with my kids, in my relationship with my friends. I'm, I'm not going to do this because it's not just talking about marriage. He's talking about all relationships. But the thing is, they used this wedding language because it was so prevalent back in the day. It, it meant so much. There was so much that was a part of that. And God was preparing us for the, the wedding with Jesus Christ. Paul says this in Philippians 2, verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus, who humbled himself. And relationships can not only find healing, but relationships can begin to grow. Relationships can begin to strengthen. Relationships can begin to blossom and take off. Now, the thing is that each of us, we have these things called emotional love languages. It's just a fact. It's just the way that we are wired, the way that we're created. And that emotional love language is how we understand love. It's how we give love. It's how we receive love. It's, it's why it's called a love language, all right? But, but that, that's what we all have. And, and I want to give you just a real quick, as we begin to wrap up our time today, real quick, they're called the five love languages. The, the five love languages. And, and it's pretty simple. The first one is just simply words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. That's easy. Those are things like, hey, your hair looks great today. You know what? You do a great job with our kids. Man, I love how you help fold laundry. I love how you, you keep the house nice. Man, I love that outfit that you're wearing. I love the way that you, man, the way that you just love on other kids. I, I love the way you serve at church. Just those words of encouragement. It is, it's just, I love these things. The, the second love language is simply quality time. Please understand this. It's not the same as time. But, it, but it's quality time. It's focused on kind of accomplishing something as, as a couple, as, as a relationship, as, as with your kids, focusing that quality time on them, investing in them, 
teaching them maybe a, a new way to do something, maybe a, a new way to, to, you know, help in the yard, whatever. It's, it's taking time to really emotionally connect with them. Maybe it's just simply going somewhere and grabbing ice cream and sitting and watching the sunset. It's about getting the chance to get reacquainted and reconnected. The, the third level language is acts of service. These are simple things like help fold laundry. I hate laundry, all right? Man, it would just pile up, but, but I know my wife hates laundry even more than I do, so I will fold laundry for her. I will fold laundry and I'll fold the towels and I'll put the towels away and I'll take care of all that. It's doing dishes, it's, it's trimming the yard, it's mowing the yard, it's, it's all these different things that you can do. It's just these acts where you are serving others, you're serving one another. The fourth love language is physical touch. Let me be clear on this, okay? Physical touch, it's not always sexual touch, okay? Physical touch is, is where, it's like the two people that you saw sitting in front of you at church last week, and one is like running their fingers through the other one's hair, and you're like, would you knock it off? You know, um, it's that. There's actually a love language that's being kind of shown in that moment, all right? But, but it's, it's holding hands. It's a simple hug. It's a simple kiss. I'll tell you this. I score the highest you can possibly score on physical touch. And if I'm having a horrible day, if, if, if I'm in a bad mood, my wife can come up, hold my hand, or kiss me on the cheek. I'll walk through hell. Let's go. I mean, it's that simple. It's just a small thing, but she knows. My wife has a zero on physical touch. A zero, okay? So we are not compatible in that way, all right? So it's just like when, when early on, a lot of times we try to show our love language because that's who we are. It's how we give love. And I'm like, I gave you a hug. I kissed you on the cheek. You know, I told you you were pretty. Don't you? Because my, my secondary one is words of affirmation. So I'm telling her these things. She's like, I don't give two hoots. You're not doing anything around the house, are you? Well, what, I said I love you. Isn't that good enough? I said you're a pretty girl. You know what I mean? It's like, but that wasn't it. Well, I gave you a kiss. That's not her love. Hers is quality time. We can sit at night and just kind of sit in the bed, TV off, not say a word. And the next day she's like, thanks, thanks for spending that time with me last night. I didn't say anything. I didn't talk. All right. You know, but that, that, that means so much to them because we set aside that time just to be together. The, the fifth love language is gifts. And I'm not talking about, hey, just buy me a Porsche, all right? You know, buy me a million dollar house or buy me a diamond necklace or diamond, diamond ring, you know, every month. It can be simple things like just a handwritten card. It can be a, one single flower. What I find with, with gifts is usually it's, it's those things that you've created that mean more to people, that, that mean more to them, that do more for their lives. And here's the thing, all right? We all have two love languages. We, we have a, a main one and we have a secondary one. But the truth is, is that, like, not all of us are soulmates. You know what I mean by soulmates? They're like the two people you see that are wearing the exact same outfit and they're like walking, and you're like, what is that? Why? That's a love language. They're soulmates, you know? And you see this connection and you're just like, most of you are going, I don't want, no, don't do that. My wife and I walked out with the same shirt on one day and she's like, go change now. I was like, but it's the Better Together series. She's like, I don't care, go change. I was like, no. I'm, so I wore it anyway, and she did too on stage. But, but here, here's the thing. Most of us aren't soulmates. Most of us, we'd say opposites attract, right? But I, I don't really don't like that. I, I say that this way. Differences attract. It's not opposite, but differences attract. Because we all have different love languages. And you might marry someone that's not at all like you in the, the whole love language process. And so they understand and they receive love differently than you do. And you give love and, and receive love differently. And it seems impossible to understand because then you butt heads. And all, but you begin to talk through and you begin to walk through these things. Because you're not fluent at this love language because it's new to you. But here's the thing. It's not just in the marriage. It's with your kids. The one thing that my wife and I learned over time was that all four of our kids have different love languages. Why couldn't they not all be the same, right? <laughs> like, how many of it, wouldn't it be great if all your kids were the exact same? You just handle them the same way, you teach them the same way, it'd be amazing. But they're all different. You learn their love languages. You learn and you realize that, that man, I, I, with Kirsten, I just continue to encourage her and tell her she's a great mom. Man, she's doing a great job. And 
that just, I see her smile, and I see her just perk up. And with Kendall, I just give her a hug. And then she just kind of giggles. And I love to watch my kids because my love languages aren't the same as theirs. But because I care about that relationship, because I love them, I'm going to invest in them. I'm going to figure that out because as we're called to be selfless, set aside our own selfish desires, our own selfish ambitions, and to, to love them as Christ loves the church. And here's the thing. Think about this. God's design his fingerprints are all over this whole thing, this whole wedding, this whole marriage thing. There's this very, very profound spiritual reality to, to love and to marriage and to relationships and how it relates to understanding our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why that verse 32 says, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church because what it does is it shows you the emotional it shows you the, the, the chemical, the physical, the, the spiritual realities of how we are supposed to be with Jesus and how we're supposed to be with one another in our relationships. And it's amazing, it's amazing, back to marriage, of how strong your marriage can be with these four things. If you're both committed to each other with a solid spiritual foundation, that Jesus Christ is a sinner. Two, both of you have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus. Three, both of you have a good understanding of how you're wired emotionally and physically. And four, you have a realization of how much Satan is trying to destroy your marriage. Not only can you have a successful marriage, not only can you have successful relationships, but I believe you can have a compelling marriage, you can have compelling relationships where people around you go, I want that. I want what they have. I want that friendship that they have. I want that marriage they have. I want that relationship with my kids that they have. I want that relationship with my parents the way that they have that. I want my relationship with my grandparents the way that they have it. But we can have those type of relationships when we become selfless and put the other first. And when it comes to marriage, man, if, if our marriages were solid, if we have a church that's full of strong marriages, not, not perfect marriages, because they'll never be perfect, but the, the idea that we're putting Jesus at the center and we're doing all that we can to grow and to build those and encourage those, man, it would change the community. It would change this city. I want to give you a challenge this week as a, as a married couple. I, I want to give you a challenge. I want you to, to today at some point I want you to pick a place to go out to eat. And I know some of you are like, great, we're going to fight, you know. But I, I want you to pick a place to go out to eat. And then I want you to take a moment, and I want you to ask each other some questions. I, I want you to, to have a conversation. I want you to invest in one another. I want you to have a date night. I want you to pray together. Don't give up on what God has created just take a step. We're going to move in this time of, of what we call reflection response today. And, and whether you're in this room or you're watching online, we, we all have a next step to take. And I want to challenge everyone today, take that step. Take any step you can. It doesn't matter where you're at in life right now. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you've been through. You, you have a step that you can take today as well. I want to talk to a certain group of people today. There's a group of people in here, and you're single. You've been searching for love. You, you've been trying to find that one that you love. You've been searching maybe for peace. You've been searching for acceptance. And you keep trying to find that in, in a person. Can I tell you today, just stop. Stop seeking that. Start seeking that from the one who can give it to you. The only one that can give you peace, the only one that can give you true love, the only one that can give you this affirmation and acceptance, and that is the, the man Jesus Christ who gave his life for you. He's the only one who can do that. Stop searching in, in a person. Stop searching for that physical peace. Allow Jesus to fulfill that, because here's the thing. He cares for you. He loves you. He adores you. He accepts you no matter what you've done. He accepts you no matter what you, you did before you came into this building or before you turned this service on online. He loves you just for who you are. 
You can't do anything more to, to get him to love you more. You can't do anything that will cause him to love you less. Jesus loves you right where you're at. And you can have that peace. You can have that acceptance. You can have that love today. All you have to do is surrender your life to Jesus. Make him Lord and be baptized. The, the next group of people I want to talk to are those of you who are married. The, those of you who are married, if you're not married, I'm, I'm going to get to you in just a second, but I'm, I'm breaking this down for us today. I'm getting very specific. I'm getting very, just kind of, I want to make this very applicable to everybody, all right? What, what I want you to do is, I, I told you I want you to take a next step. And, and we've made this easy for you, all right? We have these packets. They're just our better packets. I want you to go on a date night. I want you to go on a date night together as, as a married couple. Maybe you're engaged. I want you to go on a date night, all right? I want you, when, when the time comes, when the music starts playing, I want you to grab your husband or your wife, and I want you to pull them down here if you have to. I want you to come down here. I want you to grab one of these packets out of these tubs on the stage. And then I want you to stop, and I want you to pray over these packets. And I want you to pray for each other. I want you to pray for what God can do in this moment and on this night, because I think that this night could change the trajectory of some of your marriages. I think it can make them so much stronger. I think it could change the trajectory of your relationships. So I want you to come down here, and I want you to grab these, and I want you just to stop, and maybe you kneel at the cross or kneel on the steps for a moment, and you just pray together. And maybe you're sitting in here and your spouse isn't with you because maybe they're serving in the back. Or maybe they just don't come to church. One, please know we are praying for you. And we're praying for your marriage and relationship. Two, come down and grab a packet anyway. And you pray over that and say, you know what? I'm at least going to do this and we're at least going to go on a date night. And you say, he at least needs to take me out somewhere nice, you know? <laughs> but how could this maybe change that trajectory of your marriage? I want you to take that step. And those of you who do, if you've got social media, we want to celebrate what God is doing because we want to point people back to Jesus. We want to point people back to God. We want to point people back to the one who is healing marriages, who is mending brokenness, who is taking care of all these different things. And so I'd love for you to take some pictures while you're out. Take a picture together. I don't care if you go to Taco Bell. My wife and I are like, let's go to Taco Bell on our date night. It's cheap. Who cares? You don't have to pick like, you know, Ruth Chris for crying out loud, all right? I mean, go to Panera. I mean, guys will go away hungry from Panera, but whatever. But I mean, you know, pick some place, you know, take some pictures, and then put this on Instagram, simply hashtag FWCC date night. I, I want people to see that and go, what the heck is that? You know what? My pastor in our church cares about my marriage. My pastor in our church cares about my relationships. For those of you who are going, great, Jason, um, I'm not married, that doesn't help me. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you asked, okay? Come up and grab one of these anyway. How many of you have a friend? If your hand's not raised, come on, people. Like, y'all should be raised. If you don't have a friend, come talk to me. I'll be your friend, right? How many of you have a, a brother or a sister? How many of you have a mom or a dad? How many of you have a grandparent? How many of you know someone who's breathing? Yeah, so you can come pick one of these up and take out the word spouse and put, insert, friend or coworker. Take them to lunch, take them to dinner, and invest in that relationship. This series isn't just about marriages, it's about how we can make our relationships better so that we can change the trajectory of our relationships, of our community, of our city, of our world, that people can see how selfless we are, how much we love like Christ has loved us. You can do that too. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid to come up and grab this and pray together. Transformation, true transformation happens through the power of prayer. Only through the power of prayer. You can go, I want to get better. Are you laying it before the Lord? Well, he knows. Well, you told your wife you loved her when you married her that day, but does she still know? How, how does she feel? Man, you got to be in prayer. And, and so the music's going to play. We're going to have communion down front. We've got these prayer cards, where we still have a bunch of prayer cards that you can pick up. Prayer cards if you're married, prayer cards if you're a parent, prayer cards if you're a grandparent, prayer cards if you're a single. You can pick those up and you can just be praying through those. 
We have the, the clay jars on the side where you can take a three by five card and you can take a mark and you can write a prayer. You can write somebody's name. You can write your husband or, or your wife. You can write your kids. The relationship that you want to see mended, the relationship that you want to see grow stronger, you can write that down. And I'm telling you, we as a church, we as your leaders, as elders, as staff, we will pray for those every single day. We all have a next step to take. And I'm challenging you, do not let Satan get a foothold in your marriage. Do not let Satan tell you that you can't take this challenge. Do not let Satan tell you that it's only for married people. No, no, this is about relationships. Take that challenge today. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are our firm foundation. You are the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. God, in this moment, we offer up whatever relationship we need to offer up to you, whether it is parent relationship, whether it is with our kids, whether it's with a sibling, whether it's with a spouse. God, I pray for those, those marriages that are hurting. I pray for those marriages that are struggling, that you would convict and challenge them to take this step, God, this challenge, that you would heal them, you begin to mend them. God, I pray for that spouse, that they would take that step, that if, if their, their spouse isn't here today, Lord, that they would take that step and just trust in you, God, and at least begin to, to say, you know what, I don't care. I'm gonna continue to be selfless. I'm gonna continue to give. I'm gonna continue to do this out of, out of no selfish ambition, no, no vain conceit, but just loving as, as you have loved me, Jesus. And you will deal even more than we could ask or imagine. Lord, if it's a relationship that needs investment in, I pray that you would move today. I pray that you would stir souls and change hearts. And as we sing, as we declare the firm foundation that is Jesus, I pray that this church, that these people would move, that this church would respond, that we would say humbly, I'm not okay with where I came in at. I'm not okay with where this relationship is at. I want to draw closer to you. I want to invest in this marriage. I want to invest in my kids. I want to invest in this friendship. So God, I pray, let us as a church that moves, let us move today. Let us be willing to get on our knees and pray. Allow life transformation to happen. So we see broken marriages mended, lost being found, hopeless finding hope, weary finding rest, hurting finding healing. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's take this next step together.
We're going to sing this song together, and we're going to make this declaration together that Christ is our firm foundation. <clears throat> and, and through this song, you still got time. You can come forward, take communion. You can grab a packet if you haven't yet. You can come and just kneel and pray. You can grab these prayer cards. You can write out a, a prayer, whatever you need to do. But we're going to sing this song, and then we're going to celebrate these four baptisms. And, and maybe you need to give your life to Christ. Man, we'll, we'll wait. We'll celebrate another baptism. Come talk to us. But I want to invite you to stand as we sing this song together, as we make this declaration that we are on the solid rock of Jesus Christ.
family. Man, I'm excited. You guys can take a seat if you want to, but we're going to celebrate these four new lives into Christ today, and uh, they have come to commit their lives fully and completely to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so this is my brother, Doug, and uh, he is excited today, and I'm going to have him repeat this confession of faith, and then I'll baptize you, and then um, I'll have Tina can uh, repeat that confession as well, and then I'll have you help me baptize her. All right? So repeat after me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And today, I accept him and I surrender to him as my Lord and as my Savior. Because of your confession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit for not only the forgiveness of sins, but the gift of eternal life and the gift of the Holy Spirit to help you as you walk these days, dying to your old self. Him, and I surrender to him. And I surrender to him. 
as my Lord, as my Lord, and as my Savior, and as my Savior. And that because of your confession of faith, it's my joy, it's my privilege, my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins, the gift of everlasting life, dying to your old sin. As we do. He's going to repeat that same confession. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And today, and today, I accept Him. I accept Him. And I surrender to Him. And I surrender to Him as my Lord. As my Lord. As my Savior. And my Savior. Awesome, Rusty. Because of your confession of faith, it's my joy, my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of sins, the gift of everlasting life, the gift of the Holy Spirit to help guide you on this journey that you're on. Dying to your old ways. after that nothing else needs said but praise God let's bow our hearts dear Heavenly Father we just thank you Lord God thank you for our new brothers and sisters in the family Lord God and their willingness to take that next step and accept you as their Lord and Savior Lord God I ask that you would be with each of us this week help us to just open fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit Lord God that we may begin to start new relationships create relationships, rebuild relationships, all in you, Lord God. In your most heavenly name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.